youth. I've attended several meetings in the city since I've been here, and the only element that's not there are our young people. That's who we have to really, really engage and hear them. We have to listen. I tell my police officers and executive leadership, we have to listen to the community. It's a business. You're our customers. And that's why we're here this afternoon, or should I say this evening, to engage you. We have officers sitting along with you, the same officers that walk the beats and serve those, uh, handle those radio assignments and come in a time of need for you all. They're sitting here, so we're looking for this engagement. We want you to be candid. We want you to be honest and tell us like it is because we can't change if we don't know what we're doing wrong, if we're doing anything wrong at all. But I'm here to tell you as your chief of police, you have my support, the support of my officers to make this city safe and to work with you all. But before I sit down, before we turn it over, we need your help. We can't do this alone. And you hear that all the time. Police can't solve crime and, and, and help change the social ills of society. Everybody plays a role. We are all police in this city. So with that being said, again, thank you for coming out. We look forward to this engagement. It's very, very important, and it would not fall on deaf ears. So thank you very much.
Can y'all hear me? I just want to make sure I'm heard in the back. You can turn me down just a tad. I am Clovia Lawrence, and I'm all about healing within our community. We don't know what we need to change until we start the process of change. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you with me? All right? So we want to make sure, again, I want to reiterate that you have that conversation. If you have some issues and challenges and concerns from the Richmond area or the Richmond Police Department, talk about it. Please talk about it so we can get some changes started and we can start tonight. Y'all ready? Do you think we need some changes in the city of Richmond? Do... Wait a minute, hold on. Richmond is doing the thing, huh? We're doing it, right? So what we can do is if we're doing it, we can do it even better. Agree? And I know we're having some challenges all across the United States of America and God forbid all of the lives that are lost but all politics and all laws are local right here in Richmond and Virginia. Agree? No. No. All right, let's get started. <laughs> Pull my first question. All righty. Pastor Larry Miles' question. I'm a lifelong citizen of Richmond. That's the, okay. I want to comment on, I mean, he's writing it just like he's preaching. I'm a lifelong citizen of Richmond. I want to comment on the police relationship with citizens and businesses and faith-based groups. Mr. Pastor Larry Miles, it's your turn to comment. Don't preach comment. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm glad to be here, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to address uh, in all of my travel around the country, around the world, uh, I've noticed something about the police department here in the Richmond Metro uh, and the other places that I've gone in the North, in the South. Uh, the relationship between the, the police department and the citizens here is so very, very positive, much greater than what I've seen. But we don't have the problems that they have in Ferguson because we interact uh, with the police department. The visibility that I have seen uh, in the communities is very, very positive. Uh, the interaction with what at one time was referred to as hot spots, we don't, we don't refer to it as that anymore, but we go in prior to crimes, we go in after the crimes. It's just a very, very positive relationship. And I think that as more citizens get involved with interacting with the police, it will expand that positiveness even further and it will help build healthier relationships between the young, old business owners, um, homeowners, as well as the faith-based community. Uh, being involved and being a lifelong resident of uh, Richmond and all of my travel, uh, I will just be honest with you, there is no other place that I would rather live other than the Richmond Metro because of the relationship that I and the community have with the police department, past, present, and the future. Thank you. I know you did. You taught us a lot. All right. In regards to the recent situations and issues on the police force, such as issues like brutality, what measures are taking are you taking to ensure that officers will not use excessive force or stop the use of excessive force? That's the question. So I'm pretty sure. Chief, you want to respond? Okay. In regards to the recent situation and issues the police, with the police force, such as issues like brutality, what measures are you taking to assure, to assure that officers will not use excessive force or stop the use of excessive force? Okay. So 
So two things here. If ever there is a, an allegation made about use of force, a complaint has to be made. One of two ways. One, either another officer is going to report the, the, his observation of that use of force, or of course through that citizen contact. We have what we call an internal affairs division. Internal, affair, internal affairs investigate police misconduct. Basically, so when a police misconduct come in, they have a certain amount of days that member is usually, depending on the egregiousness of that offense or complaint, is put in what we call a non-contact status, meaning we revoke him or her of their police powers. If, if the investigation goes through, if this is sustained, depending on the severity, it's either going to be suspension time or removal from the department. Again, we have what you call a table of penalties regarding that use of force. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so, in regards to you, you first said that um, depending on the severity, who's judging the severe, uh, how severe the actual um, complaint is, and how do you make people in the community feel comfortable that their issue is actually going to be taken care of so that they can feel like going to internal affairs, internal affairs actually matters? Okay, so your first question, again, it's an investigation, so you bring in the officer, you bring in the citizens, the person who's making the complaint, you bring in eyewitnesses, but in cases of serious police misconduct, the good news is that we don't make that call. We send it over to the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, and they make the decision on the outcome if they're going to bring criminal charges. So it goes two routes. If it's criminal, we're going to send our preliminary investigation over to the U.S., I'm sorry, Commonwealth Attorney's Office, They'll do their investigation. If they say they're not going to move forward with it, then it becomes administrative. Then we make that decision on what the discipline's going to be. Did I answer your question? Yes. Can you say, state your name, please? Yes. Yes, very good question. Her question is, is there any standard when a uh, use of force? We have what you call in all law enforcement uh, organizations across the country, a use of force continuum. The lowest level is just having conversation. Sir, ma'am, whatever the officer wants you to do. Then it escalates. You can use control holes. And then, it, depending on the severity, you've got all these tools on out there. Everything from a, what you have called an ass. You see it expand over time to OC spray, to OC spray, to your surface weapon. But we cannot tell an officer, he's the one, he or she's the one out there involved and engaged. We can't tell them what force to use. I'm sorry? Yes. So, um, so, to hear from some of them, like, what do they do when they need to use the type of force? Like, how do they base the need to use force um, against someone? Like, from the actual people that's in the community that feel like they need to use force in certain ways. But, mean? again, that's a decision. We're trained. Every officer is trained. As a matter of fact, here, twice a year we have use of force training. So it's reiterated, reiterated. But I cannot tell an officer when or he should, should use force. They're the ones out there that's engaged in that individual, whoever they're encountering, when they have to use the necessary, the necessary, the least necessary level of force to apprehend or bring that situation under control. The least level of force, level of force. Any other comments? I think I have one more. Yes, ma'am. Um, on average, how many complaints do the city of Richmond receive per year of excessive To be fair to me, I just got here, okay. but can somebody, uh, I, can you answer that? Don't hold, don't hold that against me. So, so the, the numbers have been going down. So uh, we were down 12% last year from the year before. So we were around 113, 114 in um, year 13 and 14. We only had 94 complaints. 94? Yeah. And to, to put it in perspective, I guess how many interactions did you have with citizens? So on average, and we, well, have, you know, we have a slide. We have a slide. Yeah. Before you leave, I'll answer your question. Because I would assume that it's fairly. Well, if you, I, I, just off the top of my head, don't hold this against me. I think last year, 237 calls for service. That means that a radio is just about 6,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 237,000. 
indicated that our officers here responded to 237,000 calls. And I think when you look at it, it was 200 something complaints across the board. And then when you look at it, when you talk about unnecessary force or, or bias related, it was only seven that were sustained. So you think about the number of incidents and contacts to that minor number, like you said, each year the complaints have been going down. So I think the Richmond the Police Department is doing an outstanding job. Look, I want Chris Miller in the internal affairs to come up and explain to us how do we file a complaint and what we do after then. Hey, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. How you doing? Chris Miller, internal affairs detective. Right now, with technology, we have various ways we can file complaints. You can come down to headquarters, you can make a phone call to internal affairs, you can email. You go on Facebook, get a contact. We have a lot of different ways. We also take a lot of complaints, and that includes from police. So almost anybody can make a complaint, and it's going to be investigated. Go ahead. Um, So we're going to have officers taking your questions. We need you to fill these out, okay? We had this conversation before. I can't hold my officers accountable if I don't know they've done something wrong. So that's very important, a good question. You need to file complaints. If an officer is out there doing something that he or she may be doing, disrespectful, misconduct, let the police department know. Because that's one thing I would not tolerate. That's your new Richmond City Police Chief, Chief Durham. All right, here's your next question. What exactly are RBA police officers doing to protect citizens from terrorist threats? I think we have some officers who, who would like to respond. Who would think that this would be a terrorist threat? So yeah, okay. <laughs> Richmond is not- Good evening, everyone. I'm well. Officer Alameen, Southside, Second Precinct. First, I wanted to comment, someone asked about when we use force. So let me just give you an example. You see, I'm not the tallest person. It could be any type of call. I responded to calls. I'll give you an example off Paul Street. There was a funeral going on, 
and families got into an altercation. Now I'm talking about 30 people, and I respond, and I have to stop them from fighting. Okay, so I may do something like, and I hate to, to use you as an example, but I may just go into the middle of a crowd, just walk with me this way. That's actually force. Okay, now, a lot of times people just want to get their frustrations out, and that's enough. But if he were to grab me, then I have to do more. Okay, I do what's necessary to stop the disturbance. Okay, a lot of times people can be, let's say, drunk. People think things are going a certain way when they're drinking, and they're not. I have to say in a certain manner, this shouldn't be going on, you need to do other things, go somewhere else. Sometimes they don't do that, they don't listen. I have to affect that situation by putting my hands on someone, okay? Please believe that we don't want to use force. It's paperwork. We have somebody who can call in and say anything happened, I've been complained on, but I have to do my job. And when somebody's calling me, like a young lady like this, saying this person is kicking down my door, it doesn't belong on my porch, I have to deal with that situation. There's another thing. I have rules to follow. The citizens don't necessarily have a, a list of rules to follow. They can do anything they want. They can have anything on them. And I have to keep that in mind when I'm addressing that situation. As far as terrorism, I can't say that I'm looking for bombs or anything like that for whoever had that question, but I'm patrolling. I'm actively patrolling. I like to be out in the community. Anyone who lives over on the south side, I'm sure you've seen this little ball dude throwing footballs, playing basketball with the kids, and having a word with, with some folks who are not doing savory things in the community. Um, but being seen, and honestly, if I could get any point across, it would be, we're people. When I get home, I'm going to take this uniform off, and I'm going to pet my dog, or kiss my wife, and I'm going to watch television. Okay, so I get offended by the same things you get offended at. Okay, I'm 40 years old, I'm not as young as I used to be, I'm not as strong as I used to be, or fast, but I, I'm a little more wise. So I treat people the way I want to be treated, but again, people don't have to do that. It's my job to do it. And I love my job. That's another thing. I love it. So, I probably talk too much, but. Well, what we're going to do is, with a lot of the relative questions, we're going to take notes and we're going to do a follow up. We have a couple of questions about police policy and procedures. Um, Mr. Miller answered that with internal affairs. Was it Homeland Security? Were you, were you concerned about the terrorist? You talk We have it. Yeah, we have everything here. So about the terrorist threats and Homeland Security. I'll give you a thirty-second answer. Just a thirty-second answer to the question. We we ask. Every single person in this room, every every single citizen in Richmond, that if you see something, say something. You are our our eyes and ears. There are only so many officers, so we are all in this together. We also monitor what's going on around and around the world and in our country in regards to terrorism and terrorist threats. We take them seriously, so we pay attention to those things, and if need be, we use our resources such as the FBI to investigate and to further deal with any type of situation like that. I'll be here wherever I have the question. If you want to have further dialogue, then we'll get into it a little bit more. But that gives you a, a little thumbnail, and in deference to the time, we'll move on to that point. Is that good? Thank you. Right. Is that helping a little bit? Yeah. So once again, if you have more profound questions or tougher questions, Richmond Police Department has agreed to do follow-ups so you can talk and share with them one-on-one. -on -one. We just want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to speak, ask a question or a comment or concern. All right, are y'all with me? All right, here's the next question. How can we get a young black man or woman to feel comfortable enough to come to police for help when they're in trouble, not to feel like the police don't care about them? I think that's an interesting question. Um, I don't think we need to actually specify what the person 
person looks like. And the Kentucky Washington Curriculum Police Department looks at all of you, the citizens of our city. So if anybody has a problem, I would like to think that one of the first people they'd be interested in talking to is the police officer. We have a whole bevy of resources that are available to us that we can help. Whether it's something like you're having issues at home, or you're having a mental health crisis, or you're having issues with your neighbors, any sort of quality of life issues you might have, or a crime-related issue. That's what we're here for. So I think the initial question was about how a young African-American person would feel. One of the things we've actually done recently that uh, the Richmond Police Department started this initiative before a lot of these nationwide discussions started was an initiative we talked before we talked about reducing bias in police. Okay? And every Richmond police officer from the command staff on down to the newest working on the department is going through this day-long training. A lot of it is acknowledging inherent bias in us as people. That when we interact with somebody, our life experiences obviously come into play. And once we recognize that we're bringing our entire life with us in every interaction, we can work on minimizing any bias we bring into a situation. So that is one of the big things that Portland has done in the recent uh, time frame, is trying to recognize that, like Officer Elamine said, we're people. And we bring some of our personal life and experience into our interactions with the citizens of the community. And hopefully, once we're aware that we're doing that, we can work towards making those interactions better. So I would say anybody, young, old, uh, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever you are, the Richmond Police Department is diverse too and is representative of you. And we welcome you to come forward to us and talk to us. And that's one of the big things is starting that conversation lets us figure out what's going on. I just want to make sure, so, okay, we have a question. Hi. Hi, back. <laughs> um, basically, um, of course, um, a lot was being, <clears throat> sorry, make sure everyone can hear me. Basically, a lot was being said. What I feel like was coming across was, what I feel like was coming across was um, colorblindness, and me as a black woman, um, I'm full of color, so say you're colorblind, that doesn't exist in our American society. As we can see, we're very racially diverse and biased. So again, as a black woman, knowing the issues that black people have had with the police since way back when, how exactly can I feel as though I'm going to get the same protection as that of a white woman, or a white person for any sake? Okay. How you doing? I'm officer at the board. I work at Third Precincts in the West End. I think it's a really good question. Richmond uh, historically has been a predominantly black city. We can agree on that. Over the last few years, we've become more and more of a diverse city, which is a good thing. Our department reflects that. We're a very diverse department. My shift that I work at has 14 officers. We have females, males, black, white. We have one that was born in the former Soviet Union. Uh, we have multiple different languages that are just spoken within that one uh, shift of 14 officers. That's a very small collection of our department. I agree that in some instances, people are more comfortable talking to maybe somebody that reflects what they look like or somebody that reflects what their family looks like. And that's understandable for any of us. So I would say, and I tell this to, uh, to people that we interact, if you are not comfortable talking to me, tell me what you are comfortable talking to. We have 750 police officers, I'll find it. If, I'm a bald white guy, okay? I didn't help that I was born this color, and I didn't help that I have bad hair genes. <laughs> you might not be comfortable talking to me because of things that happened 50 years ago in our country. If you're more comfortable talking to a black female officer, that's perfectly fine, let me know. I'll find it, because we have that. We have all kinds of different people, and, and sometimes it's not communicated to us that I would rather speak to a different officer, no matter what the reason may be. We can accommodate it if we do. But I will assure you that all of us have had the same training, uh, the bias reduction training that, that we've all gone through recently has really helped that, I, I think. Um, and as far as the addressing 
uh, young members of our community, which I think the original question said something about young males trusting the police. We do a lot of things. Uh, we have an athletic league for young children. We take kids to uh, back to school shopping every summer. We read to children. We're getting ready to do it here uh, in March. We go to all the elementary schools in the city and we read to children. Uh, in the community that I work right now, we go door to door and meet with the teenagers, 13, 14, 15 years old, so that they don't necessarily get as influenced by some of the older uh, kids that have already maybe fallen into a bad path. And even with those kids, we try to get back to the right path. So just to kind of reiterate, we do reach out to schools, school-age children. We have a lot of activities that we do with them. And if any citizen is uncomfortable talking to a specific police officer for whatever reason, ask to talk to somebody else. It's, it's, it's easy that we won't be offended by that. We really won't. Thank you, officer. I would like to acknowledge our elected officials that are joining us here today. Reba Trammell, Councilwoman, 8th District, Richmond City Council. How you doing? And we would also like to uh, mention Madam President of the Richmond City Council. Representing the 9th District, Councilwoman Michelle Mosby. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you all of the organizations that are joining us here tonight. Again, the only way we can make changes is we have to be a part of the change. Are we learning anything? Are we getting closer? Are we doing something? Or if you don't have that question answered quite the way you want it, just write it down, okay? So we can go ahead and get it answered now. We have the Richmond Police Department here. We have internal affairs here. And I'm gonna go on to the next question. We want all of the responses down to about two minutes. And if we have time left, we're gonna do a follow-up. Okay, hold on one second. They get arrested. All right. So what's going to happen is we're going to we're going to be kind to every person that's here today. We're going to do examples. We're going to do explanations. We're going to do follow up. I believe in letting everybody get an opportunity or a turn to speak. The longer we talk, somebody else will feel confident about making a comment or a concern or a situation that they've had. Okay. We're going to keep all comments down to two minutes. I'm going to pull the questions first from the people who did what they were supposed to do, write the questions, and anything else is left, then we're going to get back to the audience. Are we clear? Yes. I just want to make sure we're together. We can't make any changes if we're not together. What is the proper procedure for a traffic stop? We just talked about it. What can the police officer do and what can the police not do if you feel your rights are being violated? And we pretty much answered that, but I wanted to acknowledge this question. Do I have the right to record the police at a minimal distance 
what kind of training, if any, is being provided by your police department? Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Officer Jerome Andrzejczak. I am an instructor here at the Training Academy. I also have trained uh, use of force for the department as well. I think you got to turn it into one. Okay. Um, for traffic stops, best thing to do for the officer and for yourself is to simply keep your hands visible. All right. The, there are plenty of video, or There's plenty of videos out there. All right, that show the officer involved shootings. All right, a lot of a lot of the times, the officer tends to get hurt because they don't ask to see the person's hands. Well, it's going to hurt somebody. The weapon comes from the hands. All right. So if an, off, if an officer asks you to put your hands on the steering wheel to show your hands, simply just put them on the steering wheel. Like the officer said before, we're humans. All right. Knives, bullets, hurt us just like they would hurt anybody else. All right. We have family, friends, people that we care about that we want to make it home to. Every day that we leave our house, we don't know if we're coming home. All right. The officers need to be as careful as possible out on the street so that we can make it home to our families. It's nothing against you. It's nothing against your child like being out for whatever reason they pulled you over for. All right. We're simply being safe. We train our officers to be as safe as possible so that we can all go home, so that we don't have to put our friends and family through the pain of us not going home. All right? With that being said as well, we want to make sure that you are safe as well. All right? Any questions on that? Recording. Great. The, the recording? You guys are allowed to record whenever you'd like. All right? You guys can record us. And we're out in the public. If you're out in the public, we can be recorded at any time. All right? However, if that officer is trying to, a, trying to do some aspect of their job, they can stop you from recording if it's affecting their job. All right? They can ask you to back up. All right? They probably won't tell you to stop recording and knock the camera out of your hand, all right? because we're, we don't train to do that. We train, you to, or we train the officers to ask to back up so that we have the space that we need to do our job. You, you as citizens are more than welcome to record us anytime you'd like. All right? Um, with that being said as well, allow us to do our job. It's going to be recorded. It's going to be on tape. All right? If we do something wrong, Use that tape against us. All right? Go to IAD. Say, this officer did this, and then show them the tape. And we will start the investigating and investigative process. So, but what if the officer request, specifically requests that the person turn over that evidence and then destroys it? That, that would be more of an IAD issue. All right? Um, I'll, I'll let. Detective Miller, take care of that one. Okay, you said that the officer requested a video and then destroys it? Yes, because there have been instances where off, uh, uh, across the country, officers that have been recorded have specifically requested that people turn over that evidence and then they have destroyed that evidence, there, like in the case of Ferguson, so that therefore it would have hindered their prosec the prosecution of whatever they did wrong. Okay, well, I can't speak specifically to those cases, but I can tell you that if you record an officer and that recording becomes evidence related to the event, it can be requested to be held as evidence. Now, in the event that you believe it is destroyed, it will become an investigation for me, for I am. And at that point, it will go through the process. But just keep that in mind, if you plan on recording, please, if it becomes evidence, needed for that investigation, we're going to ask for it. But you can absolutely record us at, at, a, at a distance that doesn't need to be. If, if, that, if that videotape is requested, could the person before rendering that videotape to you also request that they want to make a copy of it? Most of the time, that would be a problem as long as we are insured. There would have to be steps that would have to be taken. Again, I don't like to speak about hypothetical situations. 
because it's difficult to go step by step and exactly do everything that you want to hear. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a term you always use called a scope. If, some, if somebody's recording something, uh, interaction with a police officer and it's a criminal act or a, tra or a traffic matter, any of that evidence is exculpable. We have to turn that evidence over. If it's evidence that shows a crime, that shows an offense, I can subpoena that evidence. I can't simply take your evidence from you, okay? That's almost a larceny, okay? You destroy evidence, you tamper with evidence. In most cases, that's a felony. Me and some of my coworkers, we're not going to prison over something. I'm not going to prison over something like that. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Most of the time, you may be recording me, but I may be recording you too. Most of the time, I am recording you. And, and you would want it that way. You would want it that way. Because transparency, that's a word I learned from my chief yesterday. I, I believe in it. I believe in it. I don't want nobody to think I'm hiding anything. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get into it. Look, I just want to make sure a lot of the questions that were posed here today were questions for police officers. But what we want to do is, we heard from the police department, they're going to do follow-ups. We want to hear from the community. Have you had any challenges and issues at a traffic stop or on foot in the city of Richmond? Here. Anyone here that wants to talk about it because if there was an issue with a police officer that did something like that to you at a traffic stop, they may need to get retrained. Sir, Mr. Dorsey, you had an issue? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've got, uh, I've got uh, video evidence of, of many crimes being carried out against me by the Richmond Police Department and actually also Richmond City Government uh, officials as well that are, that are sitting in this room. And, uh, um, the problem is not that it's videotaped, the problem is the cover-up after the video is, is released. I mean, I just put out a video that documents a man named Daryl Beasley being killed. Okay, Mr. Dorsey, what would you like to see change? What I would like to see change, obviously, is I would like just a simple enforcement of the law. And I've had many discussions with the new and old chief of police and their underlings which are, uh, which are <laughs> Wait a minute, hold on. No name calling. No, that's not funny. I'm just being accurate. I mean, there's, okay. There's, that's, that's the most accurate. What would you like to see changed? Enforcement of the law. Basically, okay. the Constitution of the United States says all power is vested and derived in the people. We, the people, create the government, and the government is only our service. Citizens, the way they describe it, means that we're under the jurisdiction of the government. The people create and are the controllers of the government. And what we have, what the police really are, they are only enforcement thugs carrying out war against the American people. Okay. For the well, according to the House rules, you can't use any type of profanity or disrespect. Any people that's here. Okay, we're done. Thank you so much for your comment. We're going to move right along. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Dorsey. We're going to move right along. Thank you for your comment. I would like to recognize Councilwoman Ellen Robertson here today from the Sixth District Richmond City Council. All right. Any other comments from the citizens? Come on. Let's talk. Let's talk.
And I've seen the police really begin to engage, reach out, and do that. So maybe the conversation should be redirected. And maybe we should be having a different conversation because I think we're trying to put on the sheet that just ain't fitting right now. Well, what, what we, what, one, one comment I want to make is the answer. If we want to prevent a Ferguson or New York City or D.C. and any other states that have had police brutality, if you will, and the killing of African American or in particular African American men of all citizens, what should we do as a community to prevent that from happening? respond to that. Are the police in the city of Richmond, we're talking city of Richmond, are they serving the people? What person from the community? Not a police officer, a person from the community and all of your experiences. Let's go ahead and switch that conversation. My name is Karen Cox and I've lived in the city of Richmond for over 40 years and I have seen in the 90s we had all the killings and stuff going on police department got themselves together and they combated all of that crime that we have. This is 2015. I'm going to tell you something. We have the best department in the world. Right before the pain and what was going on to not have a Ferguson in Richmond. Because our police, all of our police persons, they work hard every day. They have the children love them. You know what, they, they spend more time communicating with children to, to teach them that they are not scary people like the people had been telling them long time ago. They have done everything in their power to make sure that we are safe each and every day. They are to protect and serve, and that's what they do each and every day. And for anybody to say that they are not doing their job, they are wrong. You are blind, you can't see. But I'm going to tell you something. The citizens in Richmond, Virginia see what their police department does each and every day. Okay, do you have any person, young man in the back? Yeah, I'm a like to oppose that? I'm a press photographer. I have evidence that the police have not filed complaints on file. I've had the CPS against me. I had my friend murdered in my front yard because the police didn't take a weapon away from a man that had weapons charge and drug charges, illegal weapons. I've got evidence. I've got a blog I've had up for 10 years. Reba knows about it. I was in her district. I have stood before this, the city council and explained all this, and everybody just ignored it. So it's not just a black issue. It's a human issue. Yeah. The police are human. They make mistakes. And they also don't file reports. I have incident numbers. No reports filed for them. Why? I've got videotape of a man nearly killing children, and it was ignored. He threatened my life, and they killed my friend. Police were laughing at him while he's giving me the finger. I've got it on tape. So it's, it's there. I really need to talk to the internal oh, affairs. Yes. And with, I talked to the sergeant of the 3rd Precinct, and they told me to go to the 2nd Precinct. I think it was Steve Drew. This was my friend was murdered six years ago, the 15th of February. So this is really, you know, and it was and it was because the police did not listen to a press photographer in his front yard. But yet I stand here and film and get told, well, I can't film in public. So thank you. I'm definitely going to call. Please you follow up with your okay. okay. so that's why yeah, we all right, sir. Um, the point that I want to make is, is that 
a lot of people on here are talking about how um, how the how the police department is all good and great and whatnot. But the thing is, you go on the south, in certain parts of the south side, certain parts of the east end, which would be better represented if this forum was held in the east end or the south side. Mm -hmm. And we would hear a whole entire different story. Those people are not here because of the fact that this forum is being held in a place where the bus right now is not running to serve this area, and this is a police training camp which already discourages people to come here. If you if you were to put this like at, at City Hall or at the South Side Commun uh, Community Center in South Side Plaza, there would be a much larger turnout, and y'all would be hearing a lot more different stories than what we are hearing in this very room right now. So, when, we're about, so when, we, when we talk about this, we need to stop being myopic about it and start realizing that it, it, just because it's not as apparent as, as it is in other places doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just very here, like with the conditions going on in the city jail. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Spanish. 
Okay. Speak uh, different languages. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here today. I'm excited to hear these questions. And what I want to say to them is we need to do that every single day as police officers, not just in training. And I do it every single day. I work on my sector. I talk with the juvenile. I mentor several different kids from all different races. I'm a big brother from the Big Brothers program. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that. I'm going to schools. We mentor the children. I love doing it. So I do it every single day. And how I show them that these trainings are working, or I'm a field training officer for the police department. So I'm also, also training officers in the street and I let them know we police by behavior, not gender or race or anything um, like that. So every single day I'm giving everybody the committee out 113, somebody mentioned it earlier. I'm showing them that they can trust me by talking to them every single day. I walk my sector, I take questions from people, I'm very approachable. And that's what's important. Us as the police officers, the patrolmen that you come in contact with every day, we have to show you that you can trust us. And I'll do that every single day. And I challenge everybody in here, please put my name down on the form and come to a ride along so I can show you what I do every single day in my sector, 113, that I love. I've been there eight years. I plan on not going anywhere. It's like a promotion, hope to God. But um, I love my area, I love the people there. there is, I don't think there's anybody that doesn't know me in my area. So like I said, we have to, us as patrolmen have to show you that you can trust us every day, no matter where you're from or what you're doing, I'm going to be there for you. So please fill out a ride on the application. Come ride with me. I'm going to show you what I do every day to show juveniles or any color, any race, except Puerto Rican. I'm going to show you how I police on a daily basis. It's not just about arresting people. Okay, there's, there's other ways we can help, mentoring programs and so forth. Do I have any questions about that? All right. In, in response to the brother in the back and the brother over here, uh, we've had these uh, community forums in Hillside at the Southside Community Center. Uh, we've interacted over at Creighton Court and Fairfield Court, the Open Court. We've interacted, and the police department has an open door. And to really put it real, real simple, in response to my brother over here, we, the citizens, have to be the change that we want to see. You've got to get involved with the police department if you want to see changes there. It is not just on them, it is on us as well. we got to do something ourselves instead of just, as somebody often tells me, instead of talking about it, let's be about it. Yeah, that's right, it was. Actually, and, and I just want to um, piggyback on that. September 13th, uh, that was the first Southside public safety meeting. It happened over at Michelle Mosby's district, and we did it at the Southside Service Community Center. The entire community was invited from Hillside Court, Northside East End, West End to Richmond. And we had judges there to talk about how they prosecute. We had the Richmond City Police Department there. We had concerned citizens. But what happened with the concerned citizens being there, no one all of these activists who are doing these great things out in the community never invited any youth to come who should have been there. All right? Any other comments? Yes, Ms. Vandra? Well, he, he answered that. He said, what you have to do is comply and then you complain. Yeah. You, yeah, just be, yes, he asked you a question, just respond to the question, and come on. Please um, don't break the law. Uh, At any point in time, you can ask to speak to a supervisor, and within our policies, a supervisor will be dispatched to that seat. Whatever that situation may be, whether it falls in a restaurant. So at any point in time, you can ask to speak to a supervisor. Okay. There you go. Okay, One of the I want to respond to the compliant complaint. I just thought about that. I was pulled over by a police officer myself. And you're right, I had forgotten all about it. I did call on a supervisor to come. And that supervisor came and everything went well. But in the meantime, if you are pulled over by a police officer as a citizen, because we have a right, we have the right to remain sound. We really do. The attitudes, I mean, it's inconvenient to be pulled over. Let's see a show of hands. Who likes to get pulled over by a police officer? I hate it. 
it is always inconvenient. I'm like, please. So if I be quiet, let my yeses be yes and my no be no, more than likely, by the grace of God, I can leave. And if there's an issue and I felt like I was violated, I'm going to file a complaint. passed the law with working with the police just this past year, 2014. It's called JT's Law. And it's a law that will allow individuals who have autism or intellectual disability to voluntarily add an anonymous code to their driver's license or identification card, noting that they have this difference so that the police will know exactly how they should interact. When I first went to Senator McEachin about this, um, Bill, I personally thought that the police were not really going to want to help us out 
thinking they're already dealing with so many other things that maybe they didn't want to have to uh, deal with the fact that they would now have to look at autism or intellectual disability. Uh, we work with Hanover County Department, um, Sheriff Department to get the law passed, but as soon as the City of Richmond Police Department found out about this law, um, before we had our good Chief Durham here, Chief Tarasovic contacted me, set up a meeting, and has now added JP's Law to their CIT training. So, I say all that to say that people and police can work very well together, and ultimately, they want to be able to be to help citizens be productive and avoid conflict that can come into place. I did this law for my son, who is 10 years old, because I wanted to do it in honor of him, not in memory of him. And because of the work that the police did with me and the senator and it going through the General Assembly with unanimous decisions, we now have a law that will help the people and police work together. So I encourage you, whenever you can, to speak with the police, like everyone is saying, be respectful, recognize their authority, recognize that they have to honestly think that everybody is to harm them before they can say that somebody's out for good because they have no idea what's going on when they pull people over. So again, my law was made in honor of my son, not in memory of my son, and it was all because people and police decided to work together. That's good stuff. I have two last comments, and then I'm going to get back to the final questions. How many folks are here from the protesters? She gave me two minutes. Went, okay, great. One of the things I want to share with you all, I, I always recognize your voice. I don't know your name. Very active. We were, we were trampled. Raise your hand for me. That's our that's the public safety chairperson. Ms. Mosby, raise your hand for me. City Council Representative, Ms. Mosby. Ms. Ellen Robinson, right here. I brought those names up. I still got about a minute and a half, right? The reason I brought those names up, not to recognize them for their position, but because of their enthusiasm with citizens. Those three ladies, along with others, have encouraged me to not be silent. If there's something that is going on in the community, speak out. But they also taught me to go to the right source. I said to city council a couple of weeks ago, I'm not going to run in front of you and ask you to make me a white lady. You can't do it. I am who I am. So here at Richmond, we are unique as we said before. And the reason why I asked where the protesters were, because this is a result of the things that you all hear. Now, of course, it's been explained that laying out in the middle of the street stopping traffic, that's not the way to do it. This is the way to do it. Going to city council, standing up, interrupt the meetings, that's not the way to do it. Actually, you're breaking the law. So how can we ask the law to help us when we break the law? We have to learn how to observe the law, understand the law, obey the law, respect the law, and become law-abiding citizens. Believe me, if anybody can tell it, I haven't always worn this necktie all the time. Who have been most important, never seen a dad, I believe his name is and my challenge is, Willis, I have four sons, and every last sure one of them I taught them these words. To be with this. That's, that's all I know. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up your right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. Then I told him even something else more important. I said, you have a right to an attorney. And if daddy can't afford it, the government can pay for it. However, but if you break the law, and you run your mouth out of turn when you don't supposed to run in your mouth, then I can't help you. So citizens, I got about two, I know I got five seconds. I've been watching the clock, folks. I got five seconds. So I say that in conclusion that we haven't always been on the right side, but let's get on the right side. This is great. Give Willis a round of applause. Look, I want to get another. All right, I want to get another comment. Urban League of Greater Richmond. Uh, good, day, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Victor Rogers. I'm the current president of the National Urban League. I'm professionals. I took a couple of notes, and one thing I wanted to discuss was the first uh, 
safety forum that was held in September, I was there. So when the comment was made that the youth wasn't there, that's not true, because I represent the age demographic, 21 to 40 year olds. And to that point, when I was there, I'm going to do what I did there, and I'm going to do it now. Could everybody underneath the age of 40 please stand? Ben stand. We are here. So when you say we're not here, that's a very, uh, that turns folks off. So with that, I'd like to shout everybody out out here. Moving forward with that though, one thing I do want to bring to people's attention, I learned at that forum to engage in the Citizens Police Academy. I am a graduate of the 18th Citizen Police Academy and I can honestly tell you what I learned in the Citizens Police Academy makes me feel a lot more um, safe and aware of what's going on out here in Richmond. I'm not from Richmond, I identify with Colleen, Texas. Everybody know me, I'm from Texas, right? So I took it upon myself to understand and engage with the police. So anybody here, in particular the individuals who put this program on, shout out to Black Lives Matter. I love y'all, keep doing y'all thing. Join the 19th Citizens Police Academy. Donald Cook is the person that you need to address and it's gonna start in April. Furthermore, as I conclude, one thing that I do wanna to bring to people's attention, it's cool to do all this and um, all that's fine, I support it. You know, I did let uh, YP Day on the Hill today. We were uh, talking to legislators. But one thing I wanna bring to everybody's attention is this. Bob McCullough, not uh, this, the, not, listen to what I'm saying, Bob McCullough, he's the district attorney in um, St. Louis, right? He ran unopposed. 96% of the people voted for him. Right? He's the reason why Michael Brown's um, Darren Wilson got on, right? The only way we're really going to address a lot of this stuff is if we vote, we're aware of what we're voting for, and then we're working with the community. And as I conclude, you know, I don't have any issues with the police, and you shouldn't have any issues with the police. You should figure out how to work with the police to ensure that you're safe. Thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. I want you to do that. Okay, we talked about the first community, this community conversation. We're doing it here at the Richmond Police Academy. But we're going to have more conversations. And we're going to try to basically visit all nine districts in the city of Richmond. Would you like that? So this is not it. This is not final. It is not over. We want to get better. We're doing great in the city of Richmond. But we want to do better. And we're going to need the community to get that done. Are you with us, community? You like oh. <laughs> oh, oh. the police officer you wanna say something? Okay, you got um sixty seconds. Just real quick, I I just wanna say thank you to everyone for coming out and being professional and I love the love that we're getting. We watch T V and it doesn't happen, so it, it actually makes me get choked up. Another thing, be the change you want to see in the world. We have applications. If you think you can do a better job than what we're doing, because you might, sign up. Perez trained me, Rogers trained me, Klein trained me. I want to be the change that I see in the world. I did not like the police growing up. When I saw the police, it was a bad deal. That's how I was raised. I didn't want to become a cop, but it ended up being the most blessed thing that happened in my life. And I became the police officer that I wanted to see. Okay, you can do the same thing. That's all, that's all I said, thank you. Again, I thank you so much for coming out and being a part of this great community conversation. Give yourselves a round of applause because I understand that we need each other. We can't do anything without each other. And as long as we know that, we can build a stronger community. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to reintroduce to you our brand new Richmond City Police Chief, Chief Al Durham. Before I close out, my mama always told me, never miss out on an opportunity. So listen to what's being said. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Antoinette Archer, and I am the HR Division Chief for the Richmond City Police Department. I am a civilian, um, and I live in the city of Richmond. I, too, did not like police when I was asked to come over to work in the police department back in 2004. But I realized I didn't like the police, not because of anything that had occurred to me, but because of the things that I saw on the media. I grew up in the Rodney King era. I know I'm aging myself, but that's the era I grew up in. So I was really, really disappointed and disheartened 
about what I felt or what I perceived or what the media showed me that police were doing to African Americans. I've read your I transferred over because I really didn't have a choice if I didn't, you know, wanted to keep my job. And what I realized is that they are human. Police officers are human just like everyone else. And if you speak to them with respect, then you will absolutely get respect. In my role as the HR chief, I oversee every hire that comes no, into the department. Like I also get no. the awesome responsibility of reviewing anyone who's going to be terminated from yeah, the no, department. It, it, it is not an easy right, task right. on either end. But I segue into this because okay. what Farad well, Elamini yeah, is saying no, is just, absolutely true. If you don't want to, to be a part of that problem, be a part of the solution. We are hiring all the time. I have two academy classes in right now, and 50, my last class that we brought in about a month ago, 51% of those individuals are minorities. Because what we are striving to do is to ensure, what we're striving to do is ensure that our department reflects the community. We're not there yet. I can't say we'll ever get there, but I can tell you that my team and I, we work diligently every single year, every single day to make sure that we are a reflection of our community. Because what happened in Ferguson and what happened in New York, nobody wants to hear, whether you're white, you're black, you're female, or male. So I encourage you all to go online to www.richmondgov.com and apply for a police recruit position. If you're not interested in being a police officer, I have plenty of civilian positions where you can come in and support the officers who do the work. Because I tell you, I see it every day and I understand what the community feels sometimes when they say, okay, well, as an African American, I do not feel as if my voice is heard. I can tell you in our department, we hear you. And you may not always see what gets done to that officer in terms of disciplinary action, but I can tell you it occurs. And we don't play. And this sheet right here doesn't play. So again, if you are interested, we are always hiring. I have cards tonight. If somebody was asking for business cards, I carry my cards with me all the time. And I'm always willing to recruit. I don't want to recruit you from a restaurant to, <laughs> I don't care where you are. So please, if you are really, really interested in being a change, come and see us, come and talk to us, because we will be more than willing to talk to you and help you help us from the inside out. That's it. Thank you so much. Right quick, I know we're here to wrap up. I just want to do a quick presentation. Um, our mission statement, makes, mission statement is simple. We make Richmond a safe community through community policing and engagement. Exactly what we're doing here. That's what we're going to do. That's what's been happening. I'm going to continue that. Our core values, community focus, accountability, professionalism, integrity, um, I'm sorry, yeah, and shared vision and innovation. Everything that we do, we include these core values. Your precinct commanders, right quick, Commander Roger Russell. See Emmett, Emmett Williams, third precinct. And Oklitsky, fourth precinct, you hear? Oklitsky's in the back. Doing an outstanding job, guys. Community outreach programs. I tell you, I was in a meeting today with our um, faith-based leaders, and Again, I'm new here, but just the training, everything that RPD has to offer. I mean, just go on the website, anything from A to Z, we're offering out there. But we engage businesses, Latinos, neighborhoods, CMU citizens, schools and youth. Our Citizens Academy, Hispanic Citizens Academy, Hispanic Community Days, Command Staff Walk. This is so important. I spent 25 years in D.C. We never did anything like this. Just the community engagement, getting our walk out there. And I'm telling you, the last three times we've been out there, it's been very cold. But the men and women, we're still out there walking the neighborhoods. Community days. Faith leader partnership. That's big. And I'm looking to do so much work with the faith leaders. Focus on our youth in school. Youth in the community. And we're talking about engagement of our officers. We have a school resource officer that leads this bank. Our power bank. Uh, activities during winter break and spring break. After school programs, focusing on our youth. Again, after school programs. Annual bike thons engaging the community, getting involved with our youth. Summer camps, every kid's love for summer. 
Uh, Roberta Dean over there doing electric sliders, so I'm a robot, whatever it is. Our young adult police mission, these are kids from high school that how many times a week comes in? Twice a week. I'm sorry, twice a month come in and engage the leadership in the department. It doesn't get any better than this, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you. I told you we would come back to the complaints. If you look at... <laughs> these are the numbers of calls for service. So you look at, we're going for a five year period from 2010 to 2014. 280,000 calls for service. That means that your police officers are answering those radio ones or self-initiated. In 2010, there were 210 complaints. Out of that, when it says police, uh, improper police action, it's either IAD investigated that or what we call a service. It's administrative services, operations, or administrative services. Out of those 111 complaints, nine was by your base, one was found out of policy. 25 out of that 210. If you go across, you see each year, with the exception of 2012, they're going down. So out of 227 or 228,000, Radio calls, assignments, interaction with people. 98 complaints that came out of that, and about 10 people were disciplined. We discipline folks, and let me tell you, you have my word. If you have a bad cop out there, I don't want them to mix the ranks. We got outstanding police officers. They don't deserve to wear this badge and carry this gun. They would not be part of this police department. In closing, I think this is very healthy. I think it's, it's long overdue for me. But I think it has been going on, it will continue. We're going to reach out, as Ms. Colby has said, to all nine districts. We will continue to have these conversations. But more importantly, we ask that when you come to the next one, or tell someone about the next one, let's make sure we bring out you. I heard your brother about the folks that's here today, but that's what we want. We need our young people because, again, we have to make an adjustment also. Again, you're at our police training academy. And if something's being said and we took notes and stuff, we got to go back and look at our, our training syllabus. Again, we get a new generation of officers also. But I'm here to tell you that I thank you all for coming this evening. We need to continue this dialogue. And you have my commitment and the commitment of the men and women, your police officers, that we're going to do the best. Because there will be challenges, trust me. So thank you, and everyone have a great evening. Yeah, we took about me and my